Hello and welcome to Property Matters here on Dublin South FM. You can contact the show on Twitter, Facebook or LinkedIn at iPropertyRadio um, or email hello at iPropertyRadio.com. Your host for today is myself, Carol Talent, and I'm delighted to be joined by Vince Carney, Commercial Finance Director and Real Estate Consultant with, and, of course, CEO of Anasorian. So, Vince, you're very welcome. You will, of course, be a very well-known name um, across the real estate sector in Ireland, given that you deliver uh, a huge amount of training for the industry as well. So, hello, and thank you so much for being with us today. Hello, Carol. Delighted to be with you as well. Yeah, um, certainly seeing quite a lot of uh, changes and developments at the moment, you know, even in the pandemic time. So it's quite interesting. Well, well I tell you what, let's, let's start by uh, Amasorian. You might just start by explaining the type of work that your company does. Yeah, well, it's it's quite a broad brush approach, really. We, we do quite a lot of valuation work. So we do a lot of commercial valuations and residential valuations. We also do a lot of financial modeling and um, work with an international uh, perspective. So we do a lot of work in Ireland, the UK, Central Europe, Middle East, and uh, we do a lot of education for real estate as well, which is probably a bit unusual because quite a lot of companies don't do that, but we'll, we'll, it's one of our big things. And what's the strategy behind that? Well, the strategy is that you're, you're actually uh, helping organisations understand so, some of the key, key matrix behind the real estate businesses uh, and also just to have a, a refresher or education for their own personnel in certain areas whether it's on development appraisals, whether it's on valuations, uh, whether it's on how to do some models. And we, we have interest in, say, uh, modeling for private rented sector developments, things like that are very um, of the moment, as it were. OK, well, actually, let's talk about this, because actually financial modeling isn't something that we've discussed often on the show here. And we certainly mm-hmm. haven't done it um, in a development perspective. So you might just actually talk to us about some of the work that you're involved in now. Because obviously COVID has played havoc with um, a lot of the expectations that maybe would have been in place for this for this period in the marketplace. So how is that impacting, um, first of all, on the market, but then secondly, on your financial modelling work? Okay, um, well, on, on the market to start off with, from a microeconomic level, and this is internationally, and it's not just Ireland, it's everywhere. There's, there's some definite themes in the market. The, the first one is the demise of retail as an asset class. I think really investors have shifted away from retail big style. That has had uh, an equal and opposite effect with the rise of uh, the private rented sector, the bill to rent and uh, the residential, um, uh, if you like, earning assets as, a, as a, an asset class. That's been a major thing. And in fact, I suspect that's going to be one of the long term trends to emerge from the ashes of COVID. Um, Also, Carol, I would see that there's going to be a lot of play made on how we do offices in the future. Um, In terms of there is going to be some sort of work life balance coming out of COVID with a reassessment of whether people actually work in an office or not, or whether they use an office for meetings, for brainstorming, for essential things. So how an uh, an office is going to operate might change significantly. So some of these are key themes in how you would see the the wider market in the real estate business going um, in what I would say would be core assets. Okay. Actually, there's a lot there to unpack in what you've said. Yeah, so let's is, start with, no, no, it, this is great, but um, the demise of retail, you know, it, it, people are getting sick of hearing that COVID-19 has really just accelerated trends that were already in play. And, you know, I was listening to one um, US commentator and, you know, he, he had very little sympathy for the retail sector saying, essentially, you know, you had more than a decade's notice about this. Um, mm-hmm. So are, are we looking down the barrel at the demise of retail or is it changing? I think it's changing on two levels as well, Carol. I think you're quite right to say that. I mean, what I was saying is fairly broad brush, but if you get down to the nitty gritty, maybe what's the demises of the primary retail, things like the big, massive shopping centres and so on and so forth. I think what you might find, though, is that you'll have more local 
retail, I think we could see the return of the local high street, uh, particularly if you've got a lot more people working from home and, you know, doing less in the big centres, you'll probably find that the local high street is going to be rejuvenated, maybe, maybe uh, on particular facets, you know, it might have particular, you know, uh, how do you describe it, bijou stores, etc. And that most people will do some of their sundry stuff online. So I think that will definitely continue to happen. So the likes of Amazon and the big players are just going to grow and grow and grow because it becomes a convenience rather than anything else. So okay. I don't I don't think retail is completely bombed. I'm just saying it's going to have to a, a bit like offices. It's going to have to reinvent itself. And then uh, there's actually a very interesting concept that I've seen at the moment. There's an organisation called Souk. That's S W O K in the UK. And what they're doing is they're using shop fronts as a window stores so people can come in, for example, try on clothes, not buy anything, but then can have capacity to go online and stuff. And it gives people quite a, an option where they go to a retailer to try rather than buy and then do their ordering online. So they get the best of both worlds because one of the problems when you're ordering online is that you can't <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I, well, I would say in Ireland, particularly post Brexit, one of the problems is that um, a lot of the retail was coming from the UK and yeah. returns. Um, I actually had to visit the post office, make my first return uh, since um, since Brexit, and it was like doing it was like trying to do a bank transfer in the nineties. <laughs> you know, there was a full yeah. sheet. Yeah. There was actually two sheets of paperwork. Yeah, that, that, that's crazy. So that will definitely put a stop to because I found myself saying, OK, well, if it's coming from the UK, I'm just not buying it then. Um, so then I, I'm deliberately sourcing out EU. Yeah, um, yeah. EU I, th order. I think that's true. And I think what, what you'll find is that, the uh, well, we've already seen it, haven't we? Amazon are having big distribution centres in Ireland now. So it will get directly sourced from the EU um, straight into Ireland without the palaver. So you're right. They, I think yeah. the traditional one through the UK is probably not going to happen unless, of course, they, they make some modifications to various protocols, etc. Yeah, we've been talking a lot, actually, and it is something we've covered on the show over the last number of years. Like even prior to COVID, um, we spoke about this move to experiential shopping. Yeah. And, and even prior to COVID, when one retail store emptied, we weren't seeing it replaced by some magical experiential sort we were seeing yeah. it replaced by a coffee shop yeah you know they, they, they're all being replaced by coffee shops and, and the bigger the bigger stores um i actually i was just reading about um somewhere in the uk where a debenham um, that's right in, yeah uh, is it is the debenham has been turned yeah. into um a, actually a lecture theater for the nearby college so it's been yeah. purchased by the college and it's being used as um it's for nursing and healthcare studies so actually, even though it, it has been a department store in under mm -hmm. one brand or another for more than a century, it's now been purchased by the local university and is being used as another campus. You know, so um, I, I, and we know in Ireland with uh, so many of the larger banks closing branches um, mm -hmm. I, and through the rural Ireland uh, plan, there was talk about hubs becoming hubs. So we, we're yeah. seeing banks launching yeah. their own hubs government launching their own hubs as well as co-working and innovation hubs in an area so essentially is that what the future of um of commercial space is going to be co-working spaces and coffee shops uh, well um, hopefully not just coffee shops carol but i mean i, I think you definitely you've, you, you've hit the nail on the head with um i think you'll see the rural locations actually becoming better so you're not going to see the exodus to dublin like you've seen in the past um, I, I think that a lot of the rural locations can reinvent themselves with their own hubs because let, let's be frank, people are operating on the internet. You don't have to be in an office in Dublin. Um, you know, there, there is massive scope now for people existing buildings and repurpose those buildings, whether it's as offices or, or some other means. And that's happening all the time. That that's, It's nothing unusual. I think a lot of this has happened before. I mean, I know you you mentioned Debenhams, but there's places like uh, in London that they're already thinking ahead about what to do with Selfridges because they're, they're trying to keep these big stores, but not as retail stores, as something else. 
Would, um, would selfages, so that, surely, with that history, that would fall under experiential, uh, surely? Yeah. Almost you, museum you, status. You would like to think so, but you just never know. Um, I, I think pe people are, all, I've heard a few stories about it, you know, from um, some state of the art luxury apartment type things with special, um, what you call leisure facilities, and a, a, so in a, a complete experience in that way with some ancillary retail. But there's all sorts of things being bandied around. The, the, I suppose the point we're making at the end of the day is that there's going to be a lot of uh, existing stock that's not being used that will get repurposed for something. And it, I, I'm hoping that it isn't 99,000 coffee shops. But I, I'm, I, think, <laughs> I think the pragmatic reality is that you'll see it. I mean, speaking locally, I, I um, live in Donna Bate and uh, I've already seen things like um, there's a, a business centre in Malahide in the uh, marina that's brimming to the top of, of, of activity and people wanting to stay there. I think you'll see a lot of those happening in all the towns around Meath, Kildare, Offley, everywhere. You know, you'll, you'll see that, that there'll be a drive to uh, re reinvent and revigorate this, the town centres. Um, and I think it'll just be good for everybody's uh, sanity as well, to be honest with you. Yeah, I, look, I, I completely agree with you. And a couple of months, months ago, we actually did a show speaking to um, co-working, new co-working space providers in more rural areas. So we spoke to somebody down in um, Tralee, which obviously is a very busy market town. But we also spoke to uh, and visited a co-working space in Crookstown in um, County Kildare, close to yeah. kind of between Castle Dermot and Nace. Uh, and what they're doing, what they're offering is superb, but it's superb in such a convenient location. You're yeah. close to, you're kind of 10 minutes from Mathai, five minutes from Castle Dermot, maybe 15 minutes from Nate. Um, but all parking outside the door, lunch facilities, um, yeah. neighbor, all the neighborhood retail facilities that you would need. You know, it's very difficult to make the argument for commuting to the office stack up when you have offerings like this. You know, the same thing we've seen in Gorey. You know, they're, they're popping yeah. up and I mean, the West Coast, I, look, honestly, I, I think the West Coast is going to come out of this the big yeah. winner. And I think it has been priming for this since the launch of the Wild Atlantic Way. You know, the, uh, and yeah. the the, um, the Western Development Commission have been working so much to, to shine a light on rural living and contemporary rural living with good broadband where you can work remotely and where there are good employers if you, you know, yeah. even if you want to have a, a workplace there. Um, and so to me, it feels like a, it, it's almost like a couple of uh, a couple of opportunities came together. And while obviously you wouldn't have wished for it to happen through something like COVID nineteen, there was definitely an infrastructure along the west coast that was very ready to be tapped into. Yeah. And I know six or eight months ago on the show, we were talking to estate agents. We were hearing anecdotally about demand being up, and we we're waiting to see would that translate into people renting would it translate into people buying houses and what we're seeing at the moment is that there is not a rental property to be had on the west coast of Ireland. You, you've got whole counties with um you know with such reduced rental stock we know that the, that people are living so now it's not just anecdotal we know that people are yeah. choosing this but we don't know it for how long and yeah. so for me it's interesting to watch the human trends you're a valuer how do you even go about factoring in trends when we don't even understand them yet? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a, a good thing, uh, a good point you're bringing along, Carol. But I, I think you're right. You, with, with a lot of things when you're valuing, you, you, you have got a lot of an eye on the future. We, we, we don't, you, you can't really go back and value history. It, it's gone and done and passed. That's not, that's not what someone's buying. Someone isn't buying. Well, they might buy a piece of history by any castle or something, but the, the point I'm making is you're buying the future value. So you, you have to almost sort of like have an appreciation of what the future market and the future potential is going to be. And certainly those areas you mentioned on the West Coast, I mean, you just look at Galway, Connemara, everywhere down there. Gal Galway's been simmering for years, actually. I mean, it really has. And I, I think it could be an explosion down there in terms of um, people relocating even, can you can you believe? I, I think that there could be a massive thing. And another one that doesn't get sung about quite a lot is Limerick. 
uh, Limerick is probably going to be the sustainable capital of Ireland. It's it's so far advanced in the way that it's doing its approach to um, sustainability. Um, in, in fact, the Irish Green Building Council had a, a presentation or there was a presentation made on behalf of the Irish Green Building Council showing how they were bringing all the constituent parts of what we've just been talking about, how the whole community comes together. And um, so, you, you know, things like cycling to your, your work, the sort of stuff you're using, the water, the heat, the light, um, that the whole, there's a holistic approach is probably what I'm trying to say to, to, yeah. to how, how it's working. And that, that is becoming driven, at least the government's got the bit between its teeth on the climate change a bit now. That is gonna to come to the full evaluations for sure in the future. Um, uh, so if, if you're looking at uh, residential property, they are going to have to be all grade A, um, green certified, very good BER efficient. They're going to have to be probably HBI approved as uh, estates in terms of the um, another thing that's underway by the Irish Green Building Council. And those things are going to underpin the, oh, excuse me, underpin the value as much as location. So do you uh, think, the, uh, sorry to cut across you there, but it's just, I, I think that's a really interesting point. But Legislation, uh, the legislation certainly isn't driving this. If anything, it's probably coming to it quite late. Um, mm -hmm. So we've we've seen over the last number of years, again, even prior to COVID, you know, this wise in CSG, you know, environmental, social, yeah. and governance for real estate. And we know that investors are uh, investors have been driving this. Um, Correct. So essentially, we have developers and operators rising to the demands of investors uh, and, and to meet this criteria. So the legislation, if anything, is almost late. Now, obviously, it's still welcome, but um, mm -hmm. you know, the, it, there are critics to say it doesn't go quite far enough. Um, but uh, so again, back to valuation, in terms of those ESG metrics, how big a role is that playing? Because I suppose I'm thinking from a residential point of view, I can remember mm -hmm. um, years ago when the Beat Your Surf came in, and yeah. there was talk about how they would impact value. And yet, I know because I was working with home buyers every day, they didn't care at all. They just wanted to buy a property. They didn't care if it was A1 or, um, um, you know, really yeah. kind of off, off the chart. But uh, that's, com that's completely changed. I think that has that's changed. Fantastic. Absolutely. Um, the investors I know and the big, um, the, the huge ones as well, you know, their, their primary goal in their own governance is that it has to be grade a certified green sustainable real estate in whatever shape or format is whether it's residential or commercial that is the criteria so they're not cherry picking anymore they're actually setting the market so they're yeah. um, they're, they're not just accept that seriously they are not accepting secondary um stuff anymore it's it's just not part of their facet um, I read um, I read an interesting stat on LinkedIn, and I don't know if it's true or not. Um, but it said that eighty percent of the buildings that we will be occupying by twenty thirty have already been built. So, whatever standard is there now will actually be reflective of eighty percent, and uh, that was a global stat um, of our buildings. Um, so again, I I don't know how accurate that is, but if we take it that it's somewhat accurate. Does that mean that we're in for a huge retrofitting project? And if so, how is that factored into valuation? Sorry, Carol. Uh, sorry, I, it, it just froze. The screen froze after a second. No problem. Yeah. The line broke up a bit. No, I'm just wondering about, you know, if that's that, you know, if indeed 80% of the buildings that we're going to occupy by 2030 are in fact built already, you know, obviously, a huge retrofitting that's going to have to happen but how do you factor yeah. that into valuation well you, yeah i mean you have to factor in it there is going to be a cost okay that that's going to be the primary thing that you're going to have in there because um you, you, your value in some ways valuing what's being built now is quite straightforward uh it most of them uh, have to comply with building regulations which have a very um grade a type focus shall we say so, for example, uh, one of the uh, several of the properties now have heat pump systems in them, a standard. 
okay, which you wouldn't have heard of five years ago, I'd say. So I, th I think valuing the stuff that's being built now it is fairly straightforward. I think you're right. Actually going back and looking at the stock that's built 10 years ago, even at the height of the Celtic Tiger, um, is very difficult. I, I, I think there probably could be some knockdown in terms of the valuation because the amount of work that would be required to bring it up to proper standards, because uh, I hope I'm not being out of order here, but a lot of the stuff that was built at the height was built not to the highest standards. Um, so there's a lot of catch up to be done there. I think where it's more difficult, Carol, is probably on the commercial side where you've got some very old buildings which need to be brought forward. I think their values will intrinsically always be less than the new, newer build, as, essentially because they cannot, you cannot refurbish uh, or bring them up to those standards. You can do it to a certain extent. So I think you might find there's a, a there'll be a slight difference between primary and secondary and inside a primary market, if you like. Um, um, for those. I'd imagine I'd imagine when you discuss with clients value adjustments, you know, whether we're talking about in the context of um, ESG metrics or indeed COVID, you know, uh, ha, ha, I, uh, do we know yet? And, you know, I, I'm struggling for the way to say this because almost the reality seems pretty daunting. Um, how severe are the value adjustments going to be in light of COVID, in light of changing human trends in retail and work from home? And then added to that, the ESG metrics. Um, are, are, is the real estate sector in for a bit of a scary valuation readjustment? I, I think there are a few, definitely, Carol. Absolutely. Uh, I, I think as well, I mean, uh, and I, I go back to some basics on this, people need to take a proper reassessment about what the future is giving. So they really have to sort of understand and plan for the future. And I think we'll be seeing a lot more discounted cash flow valuations done in the marketplace as a general thing, covering not just real estate assets, but all sorts of assets, because they will have to make an honest, honest assessment about where the income and the expenditure is coming from. And that will drive the valuation. It's, it's going to be very hard for them to justify having a 25-year lease on a, a, a building and being able to say that's what's going to happen because in today's market, that's not what, what is going to happen. So I, I think in a way there has to be a rationalisation down to some basics and some basic trends and second-guessing what needs to be done. And if there's a hit, there's a hit to be taken because that hit could be a short, sharp shock but then it could build for the future. So there may well be that some reassessment of what you need to do with the property in, in, in um, case. So whether you need to get it upgraded to proper certification or whether you need to repurpose. I think one of the big things, Carol, honestly, I see is a lot of repurposing of assets. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the ones that are currently offices might be converted into residential and that might surprise a lot of people. But um, you, you know, ultimately there has to be some value made from those uh, premises as well. Um, yeah, I think the, actually the, the repurposing from office to residential is an interesting one. And we've seen the first few projects uh, brought forward by approved housing bodies in both Dublin and Cork. Um, so we know that this is something that is being tapped into as a potential solution. Um, I suppose I'm the word that's reverberating in my mind now is, you know, when you talk about the, the shock of the adjustment. So even if these these properties are to be repurposed, then they it may be a case that they won't achieve the value for that the investor had them down for. So what you describe as a shock, I'm thinking, is that a very is that a very big shortfall between the funding that, that's currently on that property? Do you know what, Carol? It depends on what view is taken, because if it's just um, a moment in time with evaluation, unless you're looking to sell that, it's not going to have much impact, right? So you, you might face face a hit, as it were, but it might be smoothed out in the longer term as the valuations start increasing and moving and the market values improve. So it's in a way you could weather the storm is what I'm trying to say. 
but if if you're in a position where you have no choice then for sure you are definitely going to be taking a significant hit okay uh, I, John, uh, thank you so much and apologies we've run slightly over time um but just before we wrap up i i think you're in a really interesting position that the work that you do depends on understanding future trends so yeah. i'm really interested in how you interpret the trends because you know obviously there's commentary out there that suggests after COVID-19 we'll all go back to normal and um, you know is, is that is that a hopelessly naive approach? Um, I, I think in a way it is I mean we, we will go back to normality but it'll just be structured slightly differently so the, the trends that we've all lived through I don't think are going to change we're, we're not flicking an on-off switch we're, we're going to keep some of those things so for example, the work-life balance for everybody in Ireland is going to improve incredibly. As far as I'm concerned, um, we should see, and it's going to be pushed in loads of different directions, Carol. So, for example, the massive commute into Dublin every day is 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 hopefully not going to happen as much as it has done in the past. And I think you might see, as we've discussed, the marketplace is getting rejuvenated in different directions. So the local marketplace is becoming business hubs, local businesses performing very, very well. Uh, you might see um, Dublin, for example, reinventing itself as a more of a, a leisure and residential place. Obviously, we've got uh, offices, but servicing those offices with local residential properties that are, are there, you know, um, it's not beyond the wit of man to see where this can go if it's guided, and it needs to be guided also by the local and uh, governmental uh, policy makers as well to recognize that. So I think those things are, are positive, they're here to stay, but I, I don't think it's gonna be as one of the, I know one of the big developers was saying, oh, everybody's gonna move back into the office when we flick the switch. That's not gonna happen. I mean, you only have to look at how a, AIB, for example, have already tried to divest quite a lot of their own portfolio to understand where, what direction they're going in. And they're one of the big players in their approach to office space. It's an interesting one. Um, and it, it, it's an interesting time to be having this conversation because, you know, before we came on air, just, you know, we talked about how do you calculate the cost of something like this when the meter is still running? Um, so this conversation is definitely um, open to change over the next uh, six to eight months. So again, as we see the rollout, uh, the vaccine rollout program and how successful that is. Um, thank you so much. That was Ben Tarney, Commercial Finance Director and Real Estate Consultant, and of course, CEO with Anna Soaring. Um, we need to take a quick break now. Stay tuned.